you remember when the brown cashier in the bodega around the corner asked us if we were sisters? And we said, no, we're girlfriends. And he asked, but which one's the man? Which one's the woman? We'd been going there for a year, giving them our money, our energy for a year. dress us with their eyes and fuck us with their words all while we hope it doesn't turn physical we remember the black man on the sea train in Manhattan who cornered us in our seats and yelled for 20 minutes about all the ways he would kill us because of all the problems we cause in the black community. Our hearts still race whenever we think about getting on a train. And even if no one else says it, we still feel his sentiment whenever we walk together through a black neighborhood. Remember the black man in Crown Heights who saw us sitting on a bench, made his hand into a gun, pointed at Nia's head, and shot twice. We wondered what might have happened if he'd had a real one. We remember the black man in Harlem, who intentionally hit me in the arm as we passed by him. And we remember not fighting back, afraid other black men would jump in and take his side. And we feel like like white Republicans when we walk past black men. Or like some old white lady gripping her purse when we walk past black men. Like she's my purse. When we walk past black men. 
And that shit hurts. Because we defend our black men. We, black women. We defend everyone. professor who told me that once you come out and stay out you'll be coming out again every day every time you meet someone new every time someone new sees you so we're black lesbians who keep coming out of the closet only to be confined to our bedroom. Because that's all people seem to see when they look at us. Everyone's eyes ask, how dare you two black women be happy? How dare you two black women be happy on your own? How dare you two black women be happy together? How dare you two black women be happy without us? Remember when our neighbor, white Russian woman, banged on our door, threatening to call the cops because we were laughing too loudly? You know our non-black neighbor down the hall had a dog that barked all day and all night and was barking at the time. I remember when this white guy we'd never seen before was standing outside our door asking Nia for weed. He said he could smell it coming from our apartment. But the only thing she burned that day was sage. And lately we've been around a lot of white women performing at women's festivals. Some of them ask us questions like, is this real? Does this actually happen to you? What's worse, being black or being a lesbian? This white woman told Nia she reminded her of her best friend who's black because they have the same lips. And they keep blaming Trump for all of our problems, as if ours just started three years ago, as if they might end next year, as if they'll actually end ever, as if they'll ever just magically fade into some distant memory. This love, this presence, this activism, these bodies, they come with a price. And we are paying that shit every day, embodying these memories. Oh, so we're Nia. Oh, we should bow first. <laughs> Hi, so we're Nia and Ness. We are based in Rosendale, New York, upstate, about two hours. 
And all of our work is about our love, our lives, as an out black lesbian couple. Everything that we experienced based on that. And all of our work, the process, it starts off as a, com as a conversation. So we're at home in our room and something happened, traumatic usually. <laughs> and we're talking about it and it happens again and it happens again and it happens again in a different, different settings, but always the same kind of theme. And we're like, okay, we need to do something about this. So we decided on a theme yeah. and then we separate. So Ness will go and write and start researching. I'll go research movement and stuff like that. Then we have something tangible. We come back together and we bring it together. And then we say like, yes, that works, no, it doesn't work, tweaking and whatnot. Then we separate again. And then we come back until we have something solidified. And then, so the music you heard was created by our friend Garrett Miller. He creates all original music for our work. We're really blessed to have that. So after we have something tangible, we send it over to him or we'll talk to him and then he'll go and work his magic and <laughs> behind the scenes. And then he'll send it over to us. We'll say, yes, that works, yes, it doesn't. Go back and forth in that kind of conversation as well. And then we end up creating something like the work you saw today. <laughs> so I know that this is an excerpt of a lar longer piece. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the longer piece is home. It's a 60-minute piece. This is a 10-minute excerpt that opens the entire piece. It's called No Place. And this piece is basically, well, not basically, but pretend like you're in our apartment and you're we're a fly you're a fly on the wall and we're having a conversation. And so we go very deeply into you know, the trauma we experience. We also talk about uh, later on in the piece how our love is healing a lot of that trauma. And what's so difficult about performing this work is because it is so personal and it's so honest and it's so vulnerable. And these conversations we have when we're alone together. So taking these personal conversations and putting it out here for all y'all to see is very terrifying, but we know it's necessary because a lot of people in the queer community, the black community, the POC community, we're all going through something similar in our own ways. So we realize it's really important to share these kind of conversations. Thank you so much for being here.